Mr. Speaker, on Friday evening last, I received His Majesty's commission to form a new administration. It was the evident wish and will of Parliament and the nation that this should be conceived on the broadest possible basis and that it should include all parties, both those who supported the late government and also the parties of the opposition. I have completed the most important part of this task. A war cabinet has been formed of five members, representing with the liberal opposition the unity of the nation. The three party leaders have agreed to serve either in the war cabinet or in high executive office. The three fighting services have been filled. It was necessary that this could be done in one single day on account of the extreme urgency and rigor of events. The situation was fast getting out of control due to the enemy making a rapid advance into France and Belgium. Obviously this lightning advance had caused a great deal of confusion and it seemed that the British Expeditionary Force could do very little to slow down this assault, let alone try to stop it. Towards the end of May we started to hastily retire and wherever this location was it was to become the graveyard of the 9th Army Field Workshop. The order was issued that everything had to be destroyed. We waded in with sledgehammers, pickaxes, in fact, with anything that could smash the machinery. Motors and tires were slashed to ribbons. It had to be total so as to deny the enemy any benefit. There was nothing usable at all by the time the destruction order had been carried out. We were told a withdrawal was taking place. Note, I said told. There were no orders now. The outcome of this retreat was that we climbed aboard a lorry and after a relatively short journey arrived at a deep canal. We disembarked and pushed the lorry into the canal so as to form a bridge enabling us to cross. The talk was, go in that direction and you'll come to the beach. But what beach? And where? No one seemed to have the answer. Could it be as serious as I thought? Well, it must be, because we'd destroyed all of our equipment. It was nine o'clock at night when I set out on my walk, and little did I realize at this time, my life depended on how I handled the journey ahead. After walking for quite some time, I came to a canal, and this time there was a bridge to cross. On attempting to make the crossing, an officer approached and informed us the bridge was mined, and we were forbidden to use it. He then pointed the way and instructed us to cross the next bridge that we came to. Well, I assumed this would be a short way down the road, but it was a very long way indeed. And as I walked across the bridge, I began to wonder if the officer was in fact a fifth columnist. The reason I pondered about the bridge was why wasn't the bridge I had just crossed mined? Was the fact that we'd been diverted to this crossing to enable the enemy to have more time to attack us? Well, I'll never know the answer, but I'm still convinced my line of thought was correct. Anyway, at dawn I'd arrived at a forest which looked the ideal place to rest as I'd walked for miles. Later on, after analysing the route I'd taken, 
It was about 35 miles, about 11 hours of walking without a break or food. On the journey, I passed many men lying down sleeping. In the woods, the roar of an aircraft put me on alert. Enemy fighters came in, strafing the peaceful surroundings. Time for Alfred to be off. This was no place for the sane. I continued my trek towards the beach, and as I neared the ocean, I encountered huge numbers of men near a place called Bray Dunes on the Belgian border. The sight on entering the town was unbelievable. There were literally thousands of bodies resting everywhere they could lie down. I think this was the moment when the gravity of the situation really dawned on me. I moved on to the very long beach proper and it was now the 24th of May 1940 and my thoughts were only to get home to England. <sighs> Gradually other members of the unit began to arrive. I'd walked many miles alone so it was great to see friends who'd survived the journey as well. And we planned to stick together. I hate to write and I'll do it as briefly as possible, the story of those atrocious days on the beach with every known weapon trying to kill us. Those that had been sprawled around the town realised that the only chance of getting away was to get onto the beach which became very crowded as a steady stream of men arrived. A group of officers somehow managed to get hold of a desk and chairs where they set up a beach orderly room. Their story went like this. We propose to draw up a roster. As units arrive and report, your name will be entered. This will determine priority to move to the water's edge to board the rowing boats to carry you to bigger ships standing about a mile offshore. The officers put their names at the top of the list and officers around the desk would take over and repeat the exercise until most were off on the next boat. Well, having observed what was happening, I sought out our nominal CO, Captain Davies. He was nowhere to be seen. When I eventually found him, he was huddled in a deep hole that he dug for himself with a blanket draped around him, a sad and pathetic sight. He, like all of us, was scared, but sitting in a hole would achieve nothing, and I pulled no punches when telling him what was taking place and to show some leadership. I asked what did he intend to do about the situation. His reply was, well, we'll just have to wait. There seemed only one avenue open to me if I wanted to survive this almost hopeless situation, to go it alone. I said this to myself, and with a stupid reply from the captain ringing in my ears, I decided to do just that. From the time we'd been on the beach, we'd been under air attack. May the 29th brought a different sound, quite foreign to most of us, and as no aircraft could be sighted, we wondered what this eerie whistle could be, and then an explosion gave us the answer. We were under shell fire. The rowing boats that some of the more fortunate had used to row out to the big ships were left to drift away after the men had boarded the ship. And with this, the chances diminished considerably for us still on the beach. It didn't do anything for what little morale we had left. Shelling continued all day, causing heavy casualties death and destruction. The sad part was, there was virtually no medical aid for the more seriously wounded. Bombardment continued the next day, however, late in the afternoon, a wonderful sight met our eyes. We saw, about a couple of miles offshore, several naval destroyers. After taking up their positions, they began to open fire on the entrenched Germans. We had a grandstand view of the battle, quite oblivious to the danger still with us. This naval bombardment must have given our hidden enemy a nasty shock as the enemy fire ceased and things were comparatively quiet. With lack of food and sheer exhaustion, we all collapsed into sleep. Many groups of soldiers became separated as more and more new faces arrived. I'd lost contact with all of my mates. I made my way towards the port of Dunkirk, but along the beach, I found the military police had a barrier up to regulate the flow of troops. There was so much activity, my befuddled brain didn't know where to look next. Two torpedoes even came rushing up onto the beach, and a small ship came in too close and was beached as the tide was going out, and it was stranded. The small craft 
making all their heroic attempts to rescue us. What a sight. The town itself was under intense air attack without pause. The oil storage tanks were ablaze, pouring huge clouds of black smoke. It was all too much for the mind to absorb. The ship was leaving port with its cargo of thankful souls, unaware of the fate awaiting them, but a few minutes away. Dive bombers came in and unleashed their deadly bombs, and e-boat torpedoes hit the ship, after which not a trace of it was to be seen. This was one of the most sickening things I saw, and to think those fellows aboard had almost made it to safety. The ship hit was the coastal steamer SS Abukir. About 500 were killed or drowned, with many survivors, including civilians machine gunned in the water. On passing the police picket line, I saw a young lad from my unit named Maloney. He was only 18 and looked dazed and out of his mind. It was pitiful, and to ignore him would have been a gross act of inhumanity. This sight, for some reason, stirred some inner feeling in me and activated me so much that everything else left my mind. Asking him if there were any more lads around, he indicated they were back from where I'd just come and I decided to go back and try to find them, or at least as many as possible. On reaching the picket line, the MPs informed me that if I crossed it, there was no telling when I'd be able to get back, if at all. It was a chance I had to take for the men, so I crossed the picket line. Walking along the beach, I found a few of the boys and told them to go in different directions and to round up any men they could find and meet me at that spot. No one questioned my order and they went their way. They desperately needed some leadership. Well, eventually, after walking another 10 or 15 miles, small groups began to arrive until I'd rounded up about 80 of us. Discipline now came to the fore with explicit orders that they must keep together. And then, to build up what little morale that remained, I stated quite emphatically what my intentions were. Well, they accepted what I said without question. Complete silence, but the looks I got indicated that they thought I'd indeed gone bonkers. I could hardly blame them for thinking I was barking mad, seeing how severe the shelling and bombing was in the port area. Well, back to the picket line and after talking to the MP and explaining the circumstances, we crossed over. It was my second trip. We collected our mate Maloney, he was still there, and we set out for the port. The sight of us marching with our rifles as a group must have been an unusual sight amidst all the chaos. An officer approached me asking, How many men have you got, Sergeant? I've got 80, sir. Where are your officers? My officers made sure they were on the first ship, sir. He made no comment but discussing it with a senior NCO would not have been appropriate. Well, now you're in command of about four platoons. Collect 20 more, that'll give you a company. It's really a job for a major, but split them into two groups, make for the mold and the ship. Well done, carry on, Sergeant. We saluted each other and then departed. Before continuing, I'd like to add at this point that the coolness of this officer standing at the water's edge with a cavalry swagger cane as his only weapon and no steel helmet just his cap, had to be admired. I found out later he was none other than Major General, later Field Marshal, Harold Alexander, a truly great soldier. And what finer example could anyone show than he did on that day? The discipline that had been strict but fair was now paying dividends, for having collected the 20 men, who were more than thankful, I began to count off the first 50. Surprise, surprise. Who do we find hidden in the center rank? None other than our old friend, Captain Davies, all five foot three of him. When he realized he'd been discovered, he looked at me like a spaniel and said, Stick with yours truly, Sergeant. My answer was short and curt, for at this stage it was critical my objective be reached. I didn't want any mistakes. Sir, I'll stick with you, but you bloody well do what I saw. He agreed and everyone was happy under the circumstances. We made progress towards our objective, going to ground once in a while as we tried to gauge when the next shells would come over or planes would attack. In a book I have, it shows a photo of a lorry overturned on a beach, and this said lorry was our next objective. 
I ordered the first 50 to make for it and take cover, and then after the next shell burst, to make for a low brick wall, and then to edge their way forward to the mole. The orders were obeyed to the last detail without any panic. Well, they having made their goal, it was for me and the last 50 to make our dash, and there before us stood the ships. The fact was, I'd instructed the men to shelter behind the lorry that was really useless for protection. But they believed it was, and it boosted morale. This had been sadly lacking by the officers during the time spent on the beach. My men had assumed the lorry would protect them, and they were confident it would, and that was all I was seeking, confidence. We had a duty to perform on reaching the mole, for there were many wounded, so I told my lads to pick up stretchers as they made their way to board the ship. Our ship. It was almost unbelievable that I'd seen all the men, all so young, safely aboard, that is with one exception, Captain Davies. He stood on the mole yelling. The destroyer was almost ready to put to sea, so I grabbed his arm and a scruff of his neck and yanked him aboard. Mission accomplished. My hundred men were off to Dover with a bit of luck. I just hoped the Jerrys had run out of torpedoes and bombs. The feeling of being on board HMS Woolsey was like many events in one's life impossible to describe. My admiration for their captain, Lieutenant Commander Colin Campbell RN and crew will never be forgotten. And in spite of a huge hole in the ship's bow on a previous trip, they'd insisted on putting to sea to rescue us. That one ship made many trips and saved well over a thousand men. We'd now started to leave the mole and were fast heading for the open sea along with the men in the little ships. Feeling I'd achieved all I'd firmly set my mind on, I started to relax a little. I sat down on deck, removed my boots for the first time in two weeks and dangled my feet over the side. It was beautiful. The Navy crew came round the deck with galvanised baths full of tea and it was then that one of the nicest compliments was paid to me. One of the lads in the unit, a Private Ibbotson, a tall, thin fellow with a mop of red hair, his face very freckled and he always had a big grin, came up to me and said, Sarge, you just sit there. We've only got you to thank for getting us here, so I'll look after you. And he did, admirably. Out from the hell that is Dunkirk, Back from the steel thrust of the German war machine comes the BEF. They're worn out and footsore. They're hungry. For weeks they have been shelled and bombed from three sides. They had to stagger back to the sea to survive. Gazing back towards the beaches, my own thoughts dwelt on those still trying to get away. Although when we left, the numbers had diminished considerably. Dover's white cliffs eventually loomed up. We couldn't pull alongside the jetty for there were too many ships tied up, so we climbed across the decks to reach the gangway. Up to this point, I hadn't given any thought to the fact that so much equipment and so many rifles had been discarded and lay scattered about the beach, but this was brought home to me when going down a gangplank and stepping ashore. Was it true we were really home? The officer in charge congratulated me for the men still being in possession of their rifles. As they were taken from us, I realised how valuable they'd be in the ensuing months. Eventually the train we boarded sat us down in Tidworth, Wiltshire in southwest England. It was one of England's perfect summer days, and while relaxing under a tree I was approached by one of the troops. He started his conversation by saying, isn't it great to be home? But I was quite unprepared for what he said next. In fact, it left me speechless, because he said, before trying to get some sleep, the lads had chatted about the past months in France, and their conversation got around to you and all the hard times you gave us in training as an orderly sergeant, and they'd said they would have shot me at the first opportunity. But last night was different. They thought you should be awarded the VC for the leadership you showed, for the extreme risks you took, and the fact that you brought us all home. Well, I wouldn't concur with all that was said because really I was just doing my duty to the best of my ability. However, I thanked Private Curtis for conveying the message to me and then I lazed away feeling extremely content. It was Sunday the 2nd of June, 1940, 
and I really was home at last. That certain night, the night we met, there was magic abroad in the air. There were angels dining at the Ritz, and a nightingale sang in Buckley. What caused all this? Stupidity. Everybody's saying that war was so damnable it couldn't happen again, shoving our heads in the sand like a lot of us. Well, the Germans didn't think that way. To them, war meant guns or butter. They chose guns. It was chose butter. No, you can't blame the army. They had what we gave them, last war weapons, last war methods. This is the result. What happens now? After this? If we're lucky, we'll get another chance. Heaven knows we don't deserve it. Get the best men in the right jobs. You think we made a start? Uh, Lord Churchill, I mean? Yes. Yes, I think we made a start. I would say to the house, as I said to those who joined the government, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. Were paved with stars. We have before us an ordeal of the most grievous kind. We have before us many, many long months of struggle and of suffering. You ask what is our policy? I will say it is to wage war by sea, land, and air. With all our might, and with all the strength that God can give us, to wage war against a monstrous tyranny never surpassed in the dark and lamentable catalogue of human crime. That is our policy. You ask, what is our aim? I can answer in one word, victory. Victory at all costs. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory, however long and hard the road may be. But without victory, there is no survival. Did that be realized? No survival for the British Empire. No survival for all that the British Empire stood for. No survival for the urge and impulse of the ages that mankind will move forward towards its goal. But I take up my task with buoyancy and hope. I feel sure that our cause will not be suffered to fail among men. At this time, I feel entitled to claim the aid of all. And I say, come then, let us go forward together with our united strength. I know, cause I was there. That night in Barclay Thank you. 